My name is Roger Buck, and today I have a special announcement to make. Before I get to that, though, some of you will recall a book I once wrote in which, as it says on the back cover, Jeffrey has a problem. All his life, he's lived according to sensible, skeptical, secular values. Then his true love left him for a new age community in Scotland. But it gets worse. Now she wants to be a traditional Catholic nun. Geoffrey is bewildered, angry, lost, until he meets a mysterious guide, the gentle traditionalist. Together they commence a most unusual dialogue of ideas concerning the heart of the gospel, the real nature of the church, a supernatural mystery, the crisis in Catholicism today, the loss of tradition, and why secularism gets away with murder. All right, that's the blurb from the back cover of my book, The Gentle Traditionalist. And the key thing I'd like to stress here is just how much the book is a dialogue. A dialogue of ideas between Geoffrey, also known as G.P.L., and G.T., or The Gentle Traditionalist. And just to show you what I mean, here's a short section from the book. As you can see here on the page, much of the book is like a play with dialogue marked out between GPL and GT. And here, GT wants to explain why GPL's true love refuses to marry him. GT, Anna may not admit it, even to herself, but she longs to marry you. I am sure of it. It isn't you she can't bear. It's your world. GPL. My world? GT. Your secular world with its new religion. Your world that claims to stand for equality and rights, but crushes anyone who dares to stand for Christian principles. This is how she sees it, I'm afraid. Her world has meaning, grace, beauty, life. It feeds her soul. Your world leaves her empty, hungry, cold. Her world, the world of Christendom, built Chartres Cathedral, the Sistine Chapel, and the Sacre Coeur de Montmartre. Your world builds tower blocks and suburbs and billboards and monotonous offices with cramped little cubicles, not to mention pornographic television networks. I invoke that now by way of making an announcement, which is to say that these characters, GPL, Anna, and the gentle traditionalist himself, are all set to return in a new book next year with the most original title, the Gentle Traditionalist Returns. Um, seriously, friends, I'm very um, happy as well as honoured to announce that I've just signed a contract with the remarkable Angelico Press to publish my new book. And no hype there when I call them remarkable. Um, they're a new Catholic publishing company in America publishing what I consider is a wide range of really quite extraordinary and insightful books about Catholic culture and Catholic tradition and really some of the terrible problems of secular society in the 21st century. I'm really very, very honoured to be published by such a fine and intelligent press as Angelico. So yeah, I want to say that that's absolutely sincere. I am honoured to be published by them. And um, I'm going to say more about The Gentle Traditionalist Returns in a few minutes. But I think I want to start by saying a little bit more about my first book, 
the gentle traditionalist, um, which, personally speaking, is like this kind of personal miracle in my life. Uh, no hype there either. It's like three, three and a half years ago, um, it's like this comet of grace uh, collided into my life, this comet from the good Lord only knows where. And, yeah, to explain that statement, maybe I'll begin by telling you that normally I speak about the gentle traditionalist pictured here on the left as my first book, and my big book, Cor Jesu Sacratissimum, pictured here on the right as my second book. But, strictly speaking, that's not entirely accurate. Because, actually, I wrote my big book, Cor Jesu Sacratissimum, first. And it was an enormous task for me. It took eight years of my life. And I really, really sweated on that book, friends. Um, it's like eight years of blood, sweat and tears. Toil, struggling with it. Um, it was also written in the course of living in four different countries. It, I started writing in France, then we went to Spain for a while, then we came to England, and finally I returned to Ireland. And a lot of that book, and a lot of all my writing, is about um, stepping back, stepping away from my Anglo-American roots, and looking at the Anglo-American world from the outside, from Ireland, but also from completely outside the Anglosphere, countries like France and Spain where I've lived, also Germany and Switzerland where I've lived. But anyway, the point here is that the Cor Jesu book was just exhausting for me. And honestly, when I finished it, I really, I won't say that I thought I'm never going to write a book again, but I guess I thought it's probably going to be years before I write a book again, because I just need a break. And then something very strange and mysterious started to happen, something that I could never have expected. I found myself with this strange dialogue in my head between these characters, GPL and GT. If you're interested in what GPL stands for, at one level it stands for his name in the book, but at another level it stands for the gentle, perplexed, liberal. So I found this odd dialogue of ideas forming in my head between one character, GPL, who stood for the perplexed liberal, being confronted by the gentle traditionalist. And it was just, for me, it was like a grace. Because, friends, I never thought in a million years I would write fiction. Um... I'd never, I'd never written fiction before, never thought I was going to do it, but this dialogue started forming in my head, and what was even more graceful is that basically I took 12 weeks to write it. Uh, there were a few little additions and revisions later, but the bulk of the book was written in this 12 weeks, which for me was astonishing, uh, given that I slaved away for eight years on the other book. And then I, I showed it to Angelico. They were already going to publish my big book, but they felt like I did, that the little book was like a more popular and accessible introduction to my thoughts. And they wanted to publish it first. But really, what I'm calling my personal miracle, this grace, didn't stop there. Um, because the book has been far, far more successful than I would have ever imagined, or I think, indeed, my publisher Angelico imagined. Um, some of my blog readers may recall that there was even interest in making a movie of it. But um, it wasn't just interest. Um, Angelico actually signed a contract with this movie company um, uh, to option it. And if you don't know what an option is, and I didn't know what an option was either at the time that Angelico signed it, it meant that for 18 months, this small American film company had the exclusive right to develop the film. So my joke at the time was, well, if Paramount Pictures or Warner Brothers, you're interested in the gentle traditionalist, sorry, um, um, because for 18 months, the rights have been signed away. Um, that was my joke.
Anyway, um, sadly to say, um, it doesn't look like that movie is going ahead. But um, I was, I remain genuinely moved and honoured that the uh, American film company really wanted to film this. Um, and who knows, maybe one of these days someone will make um, a movie of it. So, yes, Paramount and Warner Brothers, it's now available again, if you're interested. Um, all kidding aside. Um, yeah, but, yeah, I'm wary of sounding very boastful. But I will also mention that the book um, was briefly at number one of the Catholic section of Amazon.co.uk um, before a new book from... Pope Francis kicked it off the top spot. All right, I hope I don't sound too insufferable there in what may seem like endless boasting. Um, but the point I hope I'm trying to make is the book has been a very unusual thing in my life. As I say, like this comet that collided into my life it doesn't even feel like I wrote it sometimes. Um, just this very unusual grace. And because the book has been a success, I had friends asking me, are you going to write a sequel? Um, which is a logical thing to ask, I suppose. And I said, I really have no idea. I really don't know if I can replicate something like this. It was just so strange. But um, at some point, I was in Eucharistic Adoration in Limerick in Ireland, and I came out of that. And I just seem to have this storyline in my mind, which is very odd because I'm not a storyteller. I don't write stories, so I think. But it was just there for another book. And I didn't act on it. I thought to myself, this is going to be tough. And for various reasons, the second book has been tougher. Um, I put it off for months and months, in fact. Um, but then I was again in Eucharistic Adoration in Donegal. And it's like I came out of Eucharistic adoration and there was just this feeling in me that something was urging me to try it, to try writing this. You know, as an aside, if I had any advice for Catholic writers or Catholic artists of any kind, I would say really spend time in Eucharistic adoration and, of course, go to Mass as often as, often as you possibly can. You know, as I've been saying in these videos, there's a fire in these devotional practices, and if we're to reclaim Catholic culture in these dark times, we need fire. And there's a very special fire in Eucharistic adoration. So I came out the second time, and it was like, I really need to try this. And I started writing it. Anyway, to make a long story short, I think I've succeeded. Uh, months later, I have something. And I guess Angelico agrees that I have something um, worth publishing. And, yeah, it's very different than the first book. I mean, it's similar in the sense that I'm still occupied with the same themes that so greatly concern me, which is how secular and New Age culture is eating away at the Catholic faith. But it's very different in other ways. I mean, for one thing, it's actually more of a novel this time. The characters are a bit more fleshed out. Um, actually, action happens. Things happen. The first book is just a dialogue. This one has more of a storyline. It has even a villain in it. Um, he's a New Age villain. Um, um, as I say so often, I think most New Agers are very, very idealistic in orientation, they mean well, um, but this man definitely comes from the darker end of the New Age spectrum. And yes, I wanted to bring up things about the New Age in a hopefully entertaining and easily accessible way, because as I've said before in these videos, uh, the New Age is boring. Um, personally, I'm bored silly with the New Age. Nonetheless, I think there's a great need to speak about the New Age. Um, it's like I think the Catholics are really, really often hardly aware about how this massive phenomenon, um, including massive best-selling books, is really converting the world 
or at least the Anglosphere, into a more and more and more neo-pagan culture. I mean, when I look at Britain, I think that, you know, possibly in a few decades, you'll only have two options left on the table, which is a kind of agnostic atheist materialism or this kind of neo-pagan new ageism. Christianity may be gone in places like Britain. I'm serious. So in the course of the book, I try to give people a little crash course in some of the essential ideas of the New Age movement. So they'll know what to look for, um, and they can be aware of this phenomenon. But the book isn't just about the New Age. Um, one thing that's new in the book, um, and that's been emerging for me in recent months with the terrible abortion referendum that we've been speaking about in recent videos, is the book very much has a pro-life theme. And I don't want to give too much away in terms of that, but I guess if I had a prayer for this book, I would hope that it would be a source of encouragement for the pro-life movement, um, not just in Ireland, but everywhere, because there's a terrible battle being waged there. Um, it seems like a very uphill battle, and I wanted to, I wanted to join in that and really see if I could do something um, to support that. So that's a new a new aspect. It hasn't been in my books before very much. Um, um, another older thing that's very much in the book is the book um, is, um, as always, very indebted to the great Hilaire Belloc and the great Chesterton. Um, indeed, Chesterton and Belloc are almost like characters in the book. Okay, I won't say a lot more about the book, Although, if anyone out there really, really wanted to know more, uh, they wouldn't go too far wrong in looking at a recent episode I did, episode 16, which was called The Indoctrination of Ireland, but it's really about the indoctrination of the world. Maybe I say one last thing about the theme of Ireland in both of these books, both the first book and the sequel. Because yes, the theme of Ireland is pronounced in the book. As I say, my other character is not just passionate about Catholic tradition, she's passionate about Ireland. Um, you could say she's an Irish nationalist. And I suppose it's possible that some of my viewers in other countries, America say, might be wondering if the books can be related to because they're so about Ireland. I think the answer is yes. That's what I've tried to do. Um, if people were to look at, say, the American Amazon site, they would see plenty of non-Irish reviews there from Americans, um, because I've tried to make them relatable for people in all kinds of countries. Because we have the same dynamic going on everywhere. Um, progressive globalist elites are trying to crush national culture just like they're trying to crush uh, Christianity and religious distinctions. And those are, those are really themes in all of my books. But in Ireland, we see it in quite an interesting way. Um, like I've observed in other videos that it took 500 years for a country like England, say, to progress from its original Catholic orientation to a Protestant orientation and now to an increasingly secular, progressive, liberal, neo-pagan, new age orientation. Um, that's a 500 year trajectory there. But in Ireland, we see that kind of course from Catholicism to progressive liberalism in just 30, 40 years. And for that reason, Ireland holds up a certain kind of mirror for the globalizing forces everywhere. Ireland shows just how terribly powerful the media is in, in, in dominating people and controlling people. And the media is very much a theme of my latest um, Gentle Traditionalist book, The Gentle Traditionalist Returns. Yeah, media is another big, big theme in the book. Anyway, friends, I will not say a lot more now. I think I'm finished. Um, just thank you as ever 
for watching these videos. Um, I really do appreciate your comments, so please leave a comment if you if you like. Um, and also, please see the links below. Um, there's links for both my books at Amazon Worldwide, and I'll also put a link for Angelico Press, so you can see the wide range of very interesting and very important, I think, books that they're doing. So, yes, please comment, and God bless you.